Ever since I started this channel, my family and I have a running joke. Watch for Squatch anytime that we're out in the woods. But in reality, I've been watching for a long time. I haven't seen him yet, but when I do, I hope it's nothing like these two stories. I'm Carol Ann, and welcome to The In-Between, where we tell stories of the strange and mysterious. And make sure you stick around to the end to find out what miracle manifestations the like button has been up to this week. And now, the stories. This story is posted by Jilly B3. Jilly was out with her boyfriend, Eddie, Eddie's best friend, her older sister, Angie, and about six other people. And they are spending the entire day mudding in the Royal Palm Mud Flats in Royal Palm Beach, Florida, which is part of Palm Beach County. After mudding all day, they decide that they are mudded out and it's time to go home. So the whole group piles into Eddie's truck and they take off for home. While driving, Eddie spots a small mud hole and decides to drive through it as one last hurrah for the night. However, that small mud hole is not so small and the truck gets stuck. Now, the word stuck turns out to be too small of a word to describe what they are. They are cemented in place for hours. Jilly is pregnant with her first child, so she gets to steer the truck while the other nine people push. And they keep trying till about 5 a.m. when they give up exhausted and decide instead to just relax and try to get some sleep until somebody can come through in the morning and pull them out. Eddie, his best friend, and Jilly are in the front of the truck while her sister Angie and the other six friends, whom they are still friends with to this day, pile into the back and everybody just tries to settle down. After a few minutes, the back of the truck still sounds like a teenage sleepover. When Jilly hears a sound, it's like a, a rumbling growl. She knows immediately that it's some type of animal. And she says, quiet, everybody, quiet, listen. Everyone quiets down, and then they all hear it. The growling is getting louder and more aggressive sounding. Eddie has a KC light, which is a super bright light that some people use when off-roading. And he's got a single one behind his seat. So he grabs it, plugs it in, and lights up the night. That is the moment their world changes. The 10 of them have their world rocked in a way they never expected. This thing ducks down and moves. Everybody starts to freak out because everybody sees it. But what the hell is it? The thing stands straight up, just a wee bit angry, lets out a roar that everyone still remembers 31 years later, leaps over the large bush it was standing behind, and charges toward the truck. The earth shakes with every running step it takes. Eddie still has the KC light trained on it, so they all get a much better look at it than they would even wish for. It is easily eight to nine feet tall and broad. It's like an extremely large man with hair, not fur. It's all clumped. The smell is rotten and sour. And Jilly, being pregnant and extremely sensitive to smells, wonders if it's just her. Or does it smell this horrendous to everybody? They say adrenaline gives you super strength. And Jilly can tell you this is true first hand because even though they'd spent more than five hours trying to push that truck out, Eddie starts it up, bails out, and starts pushing on the door frame. His best friend leaps out the other side and does the same thing. Jilly's sister and the other six friends are screaming in the back, but they pile out to start pushing too. Everything goes dead silent because everyone's energy is being channeled into their sole focus of pushing that truck with everything they have inside, which means they all hear the creature still roaring and running straight at them. With a sucking pop, which Jilly can also still hear to this day, the truck starts moving and clears the mud hole. Everyone throws themselves into the back as Eddie and his best friend jump in and Eddie floors it. The access road through the woods 
is full of tight turns, but they fly around those turns as if the devil himself is chasing them. After they get out and onto the main road, they head for a gas station so they can stop and everyone can get out and calm down. When they get there, everyone gets out and takes a seat on the ground by the gas station wall. No one says a word as they all just sit there in silence trying to process what has just happened. This is lore. This isn't real. These things don't exist. Yet they all saw it, they all heard it, and they all smelled it. Eventually, Eddie drives everybody home, dropping them off one by one. Not a word is spoken. Julie doesn't even bring it up with her sister until about five years ago, and then they kind of slowly started talking to all of the others. 25 years after the fact, every single one of them that will talk about it has the same story forever burned into their memory. It may have taken 20 years to process everything, but now Jilly can look back and say, holy crap, we saw a freaking Bigfoot. This story was posted by Bob the Butcher. About 10 or 12 years ago, Bob just happens to meet a dedicated Bigfoot researcher who, for the sake of this story, we're going to call Sam. So he meets Sam at the bar while living in Norman, Oklahoma. And he's thinking, this guy's a squatcher? The only people who catch more grief than squatchers are ufologists. That being said, Bob's really surprised at how level-headed and objective Sam is. And Sam makes it clear to Bob that his group has actually gathered some really interesting evidence. But he also admits that there are lots of hoaxers out there as well. And it's because of them that Sam and his squatcher brethren catch so much flack. Sam says, you know, if you're curious, there are some really good documentaries out there you can watch. And he throws a few titles at Bob. Bob goes home, has a few more beers and does some of his own research. And guess what? Bob's hooked. He calls Sam the next day and says, when are you guys going squatching again? Sam says, as a matter of fact, we're going this weekend. Now, like any self-respecting redneck, Bob loves to camp and hunt. So he joins the Squatch group for their weekend Squatch camping adventure. But he's really there for the beer and the laughs and really isn't taking the Squatch part all that seriously. Does he expect to see Bigfoot? No. Does he see Bigfoot? No. But do they have some very interesting and unexpected experiences? Yes. The first odd event happens when Sam walks up to a nice tall oak, takes a board, and proceeds to start rhythmically whacking the tree. Bob thinks Sam looks like a total jackass, and Bob starts to feel like a jackass just watching him. Then Sam pauses. And Bob hears it, whack, 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 off in the distance. Bob almost craps a cinder block. Someone or something is responding to Sam. The Squatchers all just smile and Sam says, good, looks like they're still in the area. Good? Bigfoot being less than a mile away from them is good? Bob hasn't really believed in Bigfoot at any level up until this point. But the forest starts to look a lot creepier now that he sorta of does. The idea of being carried off by an eight foot tall hairy ape is not really what he had in mind for this weekend. Now Bob is seriously starting to question Sam's sanity. But according to Sam, Bigfoot's mostly harmless. There have been attacks, he says, but mostly they give a lot of warning and would rather not be seen. Bob asks, well, how do they warn people? And Sam says, you'll see, because we're going to get him nice and riled up tonight. Bob thinks, great. He is literally messing with Sasquatch, but without the benefit of beef jerky. It's freezing cold outside, and Bob's armed with nothing but a machete. He's actually starting to get a little scared. 
He's already on edge from the wood knocking exchange, and now he finds out that's just the beginning. So the night goes on happily enough. Hot dogs over the campfire, Coors Light, Kumbaya, etc. But about 1 a.m., things get real. Sam starts blasting the most blood curdling sounds of pigs being slaughtered through a megaphone. To Bob's utter amazement, first one, then two, and then a lot of rocks start pelting them from the tree line. Now, one might think, oh, it's just rocks, don't be such a wimp. But these are big rocks. And Bob is even more scared when he realizes that whoever is throwing these rocks has been standing at the tree line watching them. So under a hail of incoming rocks, they pick up their gear and move camp. Sam tells Bob that they're completely safe. Bob promptly disagrees. He felt safer stationed in Somalia, where at least he had a gun and semi-sane people to back him up. Sam goes on to say that now that they've moved camp out of Bigfoot's territory, the creatures will probably go away. And sure enough, the rest of the night is uneventful. And Bob would know because he didn't sleep a wink. Now, does Bob see Bigfoot? No. He tries to look into the trees and even puts his flashlight on the tree line, which just really caused him to be more of uh, a target for the incoming rocks. But he can't make out anything except dark shapes, which do look pretty big. But he couldn't really see them, so they could have just as easily been a bunch of clowns with too much time on their hands. So did Bob have an encounter with the North American wood ape? Or was he just the butt of a joke or hoax? Either way, Bob says it really happened, and he doesn't really quite know how to feel about it either way. But he definitely has not been squatching ever since. Somehow, I would not be surprised if when I finally do see Bigfoot, that it's kind of like Bob's encounter. Like all the fear and no payoff of actually getting to see anything. That would be so frustrating. But... I would take that over Jilly's encounter any day. Now, for those of you who aren't yet familiar with our Miracle Max like button. Bye bye, boys. Have fun storming the castle. When you click on them, magical things tend to happen. Take this experience from Dead Weasel. Today, I plan on taking my son out for a birthday dinner at an old barbecue joint I used to eat at as a kid. I knew he would love it, and I thought it would be nice to show him where I grew up. We drove out to the middle of nowhere, and we started to get close to the spot where the restaurant was. But it seemed like I kept missing it. I would drive, I'd get close to the spot, and then all of a sudden, I knew I'd gone too far. So I turned around again and again, over and over again. I got frustrated and pulled over trying to get my bearings. While I was pulled over, I grabbed my phone, I hit the like button, and put my phone back in my pocket. When I looked up, the barbecue shop was right in front of me. It hadn't changed a bit. It was like going back in time. Thanks, like button. You saved my son's birthday. Thanks, dead weasel. And happy birthday to your son. Pretty cool, huh? So all of you, go out and give it a try for yourselves. Hit the like button and let us know in the comments what crazy awesome things happen for you. Your comment could be featured on a future video. Until then, if you're in the mood for more of our favorite hairy beast, watch this right here. Be careful out there, and we will see you here again on The In-Between.